be in our in our path to reliability uh, for small small UAS propulsion systems. We'll go to the next one. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is um, uh, UAVs. Generally, I'll go pretty quickly through um, uh, their their current state and current status. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you guys are familiar with UAVs generally and their usage. I'll, I'll, so I'll review that briefly. Um, talk about um, uh, the marketplace uh, uh, very quickly, and uh, and then I'll focus a bit on. Um, Air safe airspace integration, and uh, there'll be some technical details in there, and give our background, talk about um, you know military side of things and civilian side of things. Next, um, so as as you know, the these UAVs can be used for a lot of things. There's a lot of hobby use military. Um, there are some some niche markets, uh, commercial markets, and then. Um, you know, I really think that they're going to be uh, very broadly used. Here. Next one. So, being a defense thing, you, you guys know most of these, uh, most most of the hours on UAVs are spent um, doing the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs, intelligence, uh, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, and then you know, basically, um, you want a sensor somewhere, um, and you want it in a place when you want it there, and that's that's how you get it there. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of military uses for it. Next. Um, common commercial, uh, you know, there are just dozens and dozens of, of different things. I picked a few to talk about. Um, real estate, um, you know, I was surprised to find um, uh, a, a little bed and breakfast uh, not far from here that use drone footage, uh, video footage to market their their uh, their business. Um, there's a lot of uh, agriculture use, uh, surveying, um, the insurance side of things. Very interesting. Um, advertising. Everybody uh, watch the Super Bowl. Um, you understand the advertising side of that. It's, uh, it's uh, going, that's going to get bigger as well. And parcel delivery or package delivery, a revenue service. Um, just uh, just uh, yesterday or the day before, um, Matternet, uh, in conjunction with the UPS, did the first uh, FAA authorized revenue flight uh, for package delivery. They were delivering blood samples uh, between buildings uh, at a hospital. Um, so that is that's an inflection point in the marketplace. It changes. Um, a, a lot of how people look at uh, drones. Um, we've, we're kind of going from uh, most of the population looking at drones as you know machines of war, and, and yeah, there's military use, but I don't really understand it. To, to now, there's a, a, a really common uh, understanding that these things can affect their daily lives, and that they can be used for, for good things that, that improve, uh, improve a lot of people's lives. Um, firefighting um, has seen a, a, a major um, uh, change in how they do business, uh, and uh, you know it used to be that uh, you'd fly in the morning with a manned aircraft. As soon as uh, as soon as it was legal to get up in the air, you'd fly and go find the fire lines, map them, get back down, uh, disseminate the information, and somewhere around 10, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, you'd actually get people starting to move towards the fire lines to fight the fire. Naturally, that's the hottest part of the day. Um, drones have taken that to let, let the unmanned aircraft fly when nobody else can fly. Um, so 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, they'll go up, they'll fly, they'll map the lines, they'll bring it, uh, they'll, they'll bring it back, and in the meantime, they've ar they're already um, putting together the fire line data uh, mapping everything, and then by the time the crew wakes up, has breakfast, they can immediately go out on the fire line um, and start fighting fires in the cool part of the day rather than in the hottest parts of the day. Um, a lot of research and uh, research going on with these things uh, and wildlife surveys. Um, one of my friends is uh, tagged his cows with an RFID, and he flies his drones over them and uh, maps, you know, where all his cattle are. 
uh, on a regular basis. So it's it's really kind of interesting how how these things have uh, have affected uh, the different uh, the different industries. Next, law enforcement using them a lot. Um, uh, everything from the day to day. We had a car crash. I want to take a picture of it so that I can have that in my court case and have a better understanding of it. Um, it's easier to explain to a jury exactly where the cars were and where they went and exactly what happened. Um, and uh, record the information, record the the scene of, of things. Um, foot chases, uh, very important uh, uh, difference there. Um, you know, police officer now, rather than having to just jump over the fence of blind, wondering what's waiting for him, he can, uh, you know, launch a small drone and, and figure out what, what's over and behind uh, before he uh, commits to, to that risk. Um, standoff management, uh, you know, some hostage situations, those kinds of things um, are, are definitely benefiting from drones. Um, prison security. It's a lot of lot of that's going on now. Um, a lot lot of uh, lot of counter drone also on the, on the prison side of things uh, is necessary. Border patrol, of course, and drug interdiction. I think um, I think the Coast Guard's um, record on tr drug interdiction um, is clear. Uh, how how the unmanned systems have have really changed the game on. Um, on their ability to to detect and interdict, um, uh, you know, illegal narcotics coming through and in, in in through the water and and other places. Um, it's changed a lot on uh, basically asset asset uh, monitoring types of things. So bridge, power line, infrastructure. Um, you can now survey these things without having to put a person at risk, without having to um, harness up and get a crane and go over the side and, um, you know, worry about all of that. And the side benefit of, of this is you also get a, a detailed, very detailed record of it. So you can monitor bridges now um, and monitor aspects of it, rust spots, how fast are they growing, where are they growing, is a crack propagating, is the crack growing in, in size, distance, um, and uh, it's, uh, it's creating a, a detailed record. Not only that, but it also um, is, is feeding into the machine learning aspect of it. Um, companies like uh, Intel are using this very broadly for their general asset management. They, Intel, takes images of their factories on a regular basis with drones, and then they have machine algorithms that then do comparative analysis um, to look for new defects, um, new rust spots, new cracks in equipment, misplaced, uh, misplaced equipment, um, uh, any kind of insulation that is, that is changed or has been affected by the weather, anything like that. So there's there's a, a lot of those sorts of things. Now there's a, a detailed record and we'll combine that with the machine learning capability. The machine goes in and, and now a human doesn't have to look at every square inch of the bridge. The, the computer looks at every square inch of the bridge and flags the interesting parts so the human can go and, and review that and measure that uh, sort of thing. And they're having great, great success with that. Um, Intel is able to do it in, in GPS denied environments, um, and and uh, is it, really changing how they manage uh, their physical infrastructure. Next, next. Um, uh, real quickly, uh, in the national airspace, you know, there's a lot of hobby activity. Uh, Congress has 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 been very hands off on the hobby activity. If you in, if you fly these things for the joy of flight, have fun. Um, you know there are a few rules. Um, you know join the something like the Academy of Model Aeronautics. Um, write your name in it. Uh, you know so you can be held accountable if you go and and blow up a substation or something. And uh, um, but by and large, hobby activity is is allowed and, and encouraged. Um, there's a lot of professional grade. Uh, um, uses for the system uh, and, and uses in the national airspace.
they're doing it with high density populations. They're doing it interacting with manned platforms, and, and they're just learning how how to do that um, in in the commercial side of things. Um, what we're what we're looking for is really we're setting as an industry the expectations from the the manned industry and from from the rest of the the culture um, these expectations for professionalism. And that extends, you know, not just to operations, but manufacturing, engineering, maintenance, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, and part of that is is the industry practices such as uh, AS9100 and uh, the goals such as uh, CAR21 compliance. Next. Uh, so real quickly, the the military, the marketplace. Um, Obviously, uh, military is growing. The R&D budget seems robust. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in in these things in the military. The commercial market's uh, kind of interesting. Five years ago, you, you could characterize the whole thing as small investments and small operations. Um, you know, little guys taking big risks kind of things, but they're still small investments. Um, it's kind of a gray zone. The, the, the regulations were not real clear, and the, the markets weren't real clear, and the benefits to end users weren't real clear. The business models were not real clear. So, it, the, but the regulation really kind of had a had a uh, had a, a dampening effect on on some of the bigger players. Now you're really seeing a, a really significant investments by very aggressive. Uh, very large um, and some risk tolerant investors, and even some that are, are less risk tolerant, um, because they see the clear clear paths um, out there for for these uses. Um, you know, for instance, uh, we talked about UPS a little bit earlier. Uh, you know, driving a 6,000 pound truck an average of a mile each way to deliver a five pound package. You know, it costs a dollar fifty per mile to drive that truck. And you can deliver that package for about three and a half, two and a half, three and a half cents of electricity. Um, so it's it's a it's a the 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 monetary gains that are possible uh, with these devices is 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 pretty pretty obvious and pretty compelling uh, from a market standpoint. So really expecting um, exponential growth out of the uh, commercial market space in in the next uh, in the next. Um, Five, ten years or so. Next. All right. And uh, international. Uh, we see quite a bit of international. The large investments, large infrastructure, a lot of uh, indigenous capabilities are popping up. Um, a lot of folks are asking for for help in, in getting an indigenous capability going. Um, they all see a pretty clear path to, to market operations. They see uh, pretty low risk on on the technology side, um, so there's booming demand, and there's a lot of use for it. There's uh, a lot of countries would like to to keep ta better tabs on on some of their bad actors um, and their borders and all that sort of thing. Next. So, air airspace integrations. Um, talk to you a little bit about what Northwest UAV is doing um, to. To be good stewards of the airspace and good partners uh, uh, with OEMs and operators in in coming into that airspace, um, you know we we've helped the in military side developing the documentation, safe operation, maintenance on the systems for uh, you know we were part of the Stuas program um, and uh, traceability for components throughout the product's life cycle is really important there for uh, a company to. To keep that traceability and that uh, that that focus, because if there's an issue out in the field, um, we're able to really quickly focus in on what the issue was, and then by having all of this traceability, we can establish containment and say and isolate the potentially affected ones and, and continue operations very rapidly on the unaffected system. So that that's really critical um, for 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 the military side of things, being able to maximize. Um, the uptime on, on systems. Um, far based propulsion system testing, you know, really robust testing. Um, you know, the FAR was designed for manned aviation, so there's some quirks to it that, that don't necessarily perfectly apply. Um, we're, we're also uh, involved in, in standards writing for unmanned systems uh, so that we can, we can tailor uh, the, these things to the unmanned world. 
uh, civilian infrastructure development. Um, you know, we're really uh, pushing for a FAR compatible uh, design test uh, operate uh, design test facilities. Um, we ha we expect and we're setting up. We have uh, professional maintenance repair organizations, um, and you'll if you looked at ours, you you, you would see it be based on a Part 145 um, repair organization, um, and it'd be sta it's staffed with A and P mechanics. Um, and the documentation looks uh, looks like you would expect a 145 documentation to look, and you'd see AS9100 compliance throughout the organization. That's design, manufacturing, engineering. Um, so the whole thing operates as an aviation business, and it's all about uh, the aviation bringing aviation expectations to the, to the marketplace. Um, See, and we're setting up um, DER, DAR, ODAR expectations because when when the when the FAA um, allows more and more broad uh, usage of these devices, um, they've already declared that their aircraft that kind of infrastructure um, is is what the FAA is going to expect. Next, um, so aviation grade. Um, Aviation grade, what it means to us is really it's these, these skills and systems developed um, through the history of manned aviation, and they've been they've been there's a lot of uh, them in the people, but there's also a lot of it that are do is documented now in the procedures and the processes around aviation, things like uh, AS9100 configuration management, and the logistics and, and, and traceabilities for systems. That are that are you know throughout the whole aviation program, maintenance, overhauls, operations, training, all of that is is what you should expect from from somebody who's supplying aviation grade hardware uh, to the field. Next, um, so we'll go through real quickly uh, problems with uh, small U.S. propulsion reliability. You know, so whenever this industry started, you know. 15, 20 years ago, it was really, there wasn't even sure whether there was a, an economic case for it, whether there was a, a market there. So we, we as an industry used what was available, and what was available uh, was hobby-grade materials. So hobby-grade engines, hobby-grade servos, a lot of hobby-grade components um, that were in good enough territory to, to, to get systems out. Um, and we've relied on that through, through over time, and now trying to make that transition to aviation grade is uh, is, is really what, what our struggle is uh, is going forward. Um, so within the organization, again, all of those standards that we set up, these aviation grade expectations, we expect our people to operate that way. We expect our people to to um, have an aviation mindset and to. Um, to take it serious, as serious as you would a manned aircraft. Um, and we've, uh, when we do product development, such as our, our Northwest 44 and Northwest 88 product lines, those are built from the ground up with, with aviation materials, um, aviation suppliers, um, aviation um, to aviation standards. So looking at the FAR 21 standards um, for guidance, the FAR 33 standards in this case, uh, for the, these propulsion systems. Next. Um, so, yeah, so, so they've come out, um, the, the hobby grade expectations have yielded unreliable, inconsistent um, results, and um, when you buy a hobby gear, uh, the, the tolerances aren't controlled and you end up in the production line uh, with a, a, a low yield or a high scrap rate. Next. Um, so, urgent needs lead to compromise. Um, when when the military started using these things, we were in the midst of, of a, at the beginning of a, a, a war, um, and there was a, a high risk tolerance. And so it was bring what you got and use it as much as you can until um, until you can't use it anymore. And incremental improvements uh, were made to the systems, and um, and and that that was. 
that was uh, good enough. Uh, the, the timing wasn't there for somebody to spend three years developing a, an aviation-grade propulsion system uh, in the middle of that, um, and, and the market wasn't there. The investment for that's uh, a really, uh, really high investment to do that, and it, it was a question mark on whether these things were actually useful enough to have a big enough market to justify that kind of investment. And at this point, it's proven there's a market there, and now we need to make not an incremental change, we need to make generational change um, to that. And uh, you know, recognizing that quality can only be designed into the system at the design phase, not, uh, not after it's in production and you back it in. Next. Um, so we talked about hobby grade, uncontrolled and uncertain, so supply chain, configuration management, quality, um, continuity of supply, capacity of supply, um, you know, we've had all kinds of uh, issues in the past uh, from things going obsolete to, um, to um, exhausting the world's supply of a hobby grade component um, and having to call all around the world and, and, and calling hobby stores uh, around the world to try and, try and get hobby grade components uh, for UAV. So, so the capacity of supply, continuity of supply, um, and then the quality in, is, is just not managed uh, because they're pinching every penny and they're trying to, to satisfy hobby expectations, which are way different than um, the, our aviation grade stuff. Um, so, and, and then the basic design requirements are different. Um, if you go and uh, develop a, an engine for a quarter scale P51D Mustang, um, that it shakes, rattles, and rolls a little bit, it's kind of cool. You do that on an, a surveillance asset and you're shaking the camera, um, it's kind of disastrous. Uh, so it's just fundamental design requirements are, are different. Um, hobby grade guys don't go and operate in minus 15 degree weather and they don't go and operate in plus 45, plus 50 degree weather. Um, and, and so you have, to, you, have to, you have to design for that at the beginning. You can't, you can't back that into a, 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 a something that's already designed and already has, has, a, has it uh, out there. Next. So manufacturing inconsistencies dealt with on a part-by-part -part basis uh, in, in that, and that yields to, that, that results in low yield and, and high costs, and we'll, we'll, we talked about that enough. Next. Um, so what kind of hobby grade components can you find? Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, a lot of places where you can find them. You find them. Um, a lot of people use them in engine cores. A lot of people use them um, servos, electronic speed controllers, wire connectors. That's fairly obvious. But uh, sometimes it's more subtle than that. Sometimes just components in the engine core, the rod or the piston or um, some of the bearings, um, you know, can be uh, not to the aviation grade standards that you expect. And that's even, even from, um, you know, high quality uh, suppliers, you might end up with hobby grade components embedded in the middle of the system. Next. Yeah, so, so UAV, what are, what are the standards we're bringing to the table um, for UAS propulsion? Um, we, we implemented a uh, engineering change request process early that, that keeps uh, OEMs, our customers, in the loop with updates and improves the system quality. Uh, so this continuous improvement aspect of this is very key. Um, we adopt the aviation standards for the entire organization, the whole company is founded as an aviation company, not as a hobby company, not as a drone company, but as an aviation company. And so that leads to decisions such as a professional um, ERP um, and accounting system, um, you know, different ways of, of doing your configuration management uh, and, uh, you know, 145 repair stations uh, that, that are modeled, but the whole business modeled after um, aviation types of, of businesses, business models. Um, FAA certified uh, certifications, um, that's coming. We're, we're, we're eager to and working with uh, the FAA to, to help them understand how to uh, manage drones and ma manage uh, uh, the propulsion systems specifically into um, their, the, the uh, national airspace. 
next. All right, and with that, I will uh, relinquish control and uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming and, and listening to me talk. Um, and uh, I think we'll entertain some questions at this point, right, Brian? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so we'll we'll save about 15 minutes or so um, if we need it for questions. So if anybody does have questions, you can feel free to kind of unmute yourself and chime in or type them in over Skype, uh, and, and we can read those and make sure Jeff gets them to respond to. Um, my, I, I mean, I'll kick it off with a general question, which is, what, have you, what particular military um, uses have you seen for, where, have you seen any incidents where there's been hobby grade uses in, uh, for DOD purposes that have not panned out and, you know, they then transition, you see them then transition over to aviation grade? Um, so, so it's it's difficult to make that transition to aviation grade. I mean, yeah. So there's there's a, a lot of a lot of current use DoD um, assets um, are on uh, hobby grade uh, servos, hobby grade uh, propulsion systems. Um, they're 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 throughout the system. There, there's a lot of them, and they're they're ubiquitous. It's it's more common than not. Um, so we took it on ourselves uh, to, to instead of just trying to make this incremental improvement over what's out there and what's, what's widely, broadly deployed, um, rather than making these incremental improvements, we started from scratch and said, no, we need to design in with these aviation grade expectations from day one, design purpose-built for an unmanned system. Uh, think about things like vibration and weather environments and, uh, you know, salt spray and sand and, and some of these things that, that, that the hobby market doesn't pay, doesn't, you know, isn't, isn't in their requirements list. And, and then build that into a system that we've already built up over the years of uh, configuration control and management uh, and uh, um, maintenance and maintenance management and engineering and um, testing to aviation grade standards. Okay. Is, is there any particular size, uh, group size, that, that aviation grade would be more appropriate for? I mean, I imagine the smaller you get, you, you have acceptable risk to go with these hobby grade components. Yeah, so so it's it's the it's the old maxim garbage in garbage out. Um, you know, when I was uh, you know, when I was in semiconductors, if you had a low yield lot, your odds of getting a field return from that lot were higher regardless that it was tested the same way through the same processes. And so if you have a relatively uncontrolled thing, you know, if you, if you're if you've got you no matter how good your filter is, your odds of um having something pass through the filter um, and getting out to the field uh, is, is, is increased just based on the number of defects coming into the system. Makes sense. Any other questions from anybody else out there? Yeah, I, I've got a question here. Um, in, in general, maybe it's a size issue and, and the like, but uh, the military is trying to reduce its, um, its supply chain, so therefore uh, for example, when you're dealing with liquid fuel, they want to go to JP8. Uh, when on the other, on the flip side, I would think there's going to be some sort of standardization in batteries, so they don't have to have uh, a gazillion different batteries that they bring out to the field. So, how do you deal with that? At what at what size do you switch over to JP8, and and uh, do you work with those engines? And it and with the small electric ones, are you trying to standardize uh, certain types of batteries? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll do the engines first. Um, Northwest UAV um, pioneered uh, the small heavy fuel engine. Um, the Northwest 44 propulsion system, Northwest 88 are both uh, run off of JP8, and that is specifically to help the military minimize uh, that footprint um, and standardize on fuel. Um, we think that uh, our position is that Regardless of what fuel you use, it needs to be aviation grade. It needs to be a controlled chemistry fuel. And, and uh, if you're doing mo gas, you're doing pump gas, well, pump gas in a third world and pump gas at uh, the local Costco are just different things. Um, and, and I call that aviation by accident. So having a controlled chemistry, uh, and JP8 a great one, is, is exactly where, where the entire industry ought to go, is going, has gone, should go. 
and uh, um, our our propulsion systems are designed from the ground up to be compatible with with the logistics fuels, um, in, including JP8. Um, you know that said, the architecture of the system matters. Um, you know if uh, if, if you want to go as simple as possible, the reliability of the system, there's challenges going to jet fuel, being able to um, to combust that um, predictably without uh, um, without carboning up, without coating the piston, um, that sort of thing is, is very, very challenging, especially down at the very small sizes. And then any comment on the uh, electric propulsion? Um, so batteries. yeah, so, so so the battery is a little more challenging because um, uh, most most of the batteries are, are made in in China um, at a couple of different factories, um, and so settling settling on a chemistry for an application that's easy enough. Um, settling on a, a supplier or a configuration of the battery, um, stay, the that part of the industry has not standardized yet enough um, to be able to demand that. And part of that is that um, us as an industry don't have uh, enough of an influence over the people that are, are manufacturing uh, the batteries directly to be able to push uh, a standard uh, on them of a configuration at this point. So, so yes, we want to get to a standard configuration. Um, you know, the, uh, there are standards committees. The SAE has a standards committee on aviation uh, of electric propulsion and aviation for, for aircraft um, that is, is very much um, uh, trying to understand what kind of standards um, we, we can generate and apply to the industry generally. Thanks, Jeff. So the uh, question we also got in, typed in, was uh, is there a database of aviation grade suppliers that support UAS programs? <coughs> well, um, a database that exists, I don't, I don't think there's a database that exists. I mean, there, there, are, there are companies that exist that um, are aviation companies, um, but I think you really have to do your due diligence on a, on a part by part basis to ask those questions of what's in that, what is what is embedded in that part, where does it come from, understand the supply chain, understand where it's coming from. Um, you know, you can go to you can go to places like uh, um, Shepard puts out a really great product that's uh, uh, has uh, all, all of the aircraft and the propulsion systems and and that sort of thing. Um, but I don't know that they label them, you know, aviation grade. That, so you really have to you really have to do your homework um, when you're buying an aircraft, ground control station, propulsion system, um, to see if uh, uh, see what's what what you're actually getting inside that system. What kind of due diligence? Do your due diligence on the company too that you're getting it from. Um, are they are they taking aviation seriously, or are they are they using what's available and cheapest for them? Um, you know, you can you can look at, for instance, if you have a uh, an autopilot, you can look at has it has it been certified as a DO254 or DO168? Does it meet Does it meet those standards? Has it been certified to meet those standards? Um, those are the kinds of questions that you can ask uh, to to see where they're at. You know, are they following AS9100 practices, for instance? Yeah, no, no pre-vetted database yet. No, but um, um, I, I think uh, DSIC may take that on as a uh, as a research project. That'd be great. Yeah, no, that that sounds like a great idea. We'll see if we can get DTIC to throw in some money for that. Um, so next next question we had here was uh, if there are any specific UAV configurations that Northwest UAVs uh, will focus on. Yeah, so so we are our, our main focus right now is small engine propulsion, so internal combustion system propulsions. So anything from um, from uh, you know smaller than a Cessna basically needs a propulsion system with it. Uh, Northwest UAVs focus. Northwest UAVs uh, strategy, if you will, 
is to uh, is to populate these tier one through tier four um, uh, sized aircraft with uh, a, a propulsion system that they can they can that they can design around and and it's important to put the cart you know put that horse back in front of the cart when you're designing an aircraft uh, for for 10 years 15 years now people have designed an airplane and then gone looking for an engine that fits the airplane and anybody who's designed a manned aircraft knows that the first product decision you make for an aircraft is the propulsion system because it drives so many other questions and so you go and you, you look at the propulsion system, you figure out how much fuel you need for your mission set, you figure out how much thrust it's going to be, you figure out how much it weighs so you can balance the airplane properly, and then you design the airplane in detail because you have all of that data. And so having that, having that data is, is just key, and that's why we're developing these propulsion systems and publishing um, real expectations for data to OEM manufacturers so that they can do a better job of picking the propulsion first and then developing the aircraft afterwards. Thanks. All right, so Thanks. we'll do one last question here, um, and hopefully this uh, makes sense, but it says, has hydrogen fuel cell electric drive been considered? And I imagine that means considered for aviation grade purposes. So hydrogen yeah, fuel so cell electric drive. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm really excited about hydrogen fuel cells. Hydrogen fuel cells um, have uh, proven themselves uh, capable of meeting uh, the power to weight uh, requirements for small UAVs. Um, they are um, really robust and reliable. They have just one or two moving parts on them. Um, they had the membranes on hydrogen fuel cells last five to 10,000 hours. Um, the hydrogen is, is, is available pretty much everywhere humans are because it's basically water, and if you have water and electricity, you can get hydrogen. Um, so, the, so the logistics aspect of it's uh, pretty, it, it's not trivial, but it's, it's, it's very manageable. Um, and, but the, really, the, the thing that, that I think, I'm really bullish on, on hydrogen fuel cells because, um, because of the cost. Uh, the, the cost per hour when you divide something by a 5,000 or a 10,000 um, hour overhaul or, or lifespan of, of the membrane in this case, um, the, the cost per hour drops really, really fast compared to the, uh, you know, we're pretty proud that we get uh, um, uh, 400 to 500 hours on our propulsion systems, our internal combustion propulsion systems. Uh, being able to get 5,000 hours drops a whole order of magnitude uh, off of the uh, cost per hour. And I think that changes the games and it changes the game, especially in the commercial market, where it's really price sensitive um, to those systems. The cool thing about hydrogen fuel cells too is is you can store them and they're in, still instant on, um, and so you don't have to worry about um, you know regular maintaining maintaining them. And uh, you know there's a lot of maintenance involved in an internal combustion engine. There's just not a lot of maintenance involved in a in a hydrogen fuel cell um, piece of equipment. Well, thanks, Jeff. Um, so with that, we'll conclude. We're hitting that 1245 mark, so um, make sure we kind of stick to our time. So thanks, Jeff, for the presentation. And if anyone does have any further questions about the, the topic at hand, they can um, reach out to DSIAC, any of us at DSIAC, and we'll get you over to Northwest UAV or try to answer the question ourselves. Or if you have any other broader uh, autonomous system-related questions or anything.